Welcome to New York City, where the Credit Suisse Research Institute is holding its biannual meeting. The Research Institute was established in 2008 to identify and provide insights on global themes and trends. The current meeting has been focused on the democratic revolution in parts of the Middle East and North Africa, the role social media has played in these popular movements, and the long-term consequences it might have on the economic development of the region. And of course, we spoke to the renowned experts who make up the Research Institute, who gave us their take on the current political situation. These days, the whole world, the global economy has brought the whole world closer together in habits, in instincts, in language, in ambition. And right across the Middle East, young, disenfranchised uh, youngsters across the Middle East have seen on CNN, on BBC, they've seen Twitter, Facebook, all the social networks. They've seen what life can be like outside their country, and they would like something similar within it. The word that comes to mind is facilitator or enabler. I, I would not call the network itself the catalyst. I think when you look at this region, you can name a variety of reasons why it was ripe for some kind of revolutionary upsurge. Youth unemployment, surging food prices, corrupt regimes, no succession plans, widening inequality, high levels of poverty. This is a, a very fertile ground for uh, a popular uprising. But to link people whose interest is in a popular uprising, but who otherwise their interest might be different say rural and urban, farmer and um, industrial worker, young person and old person, how are you going to link those people together? And it turned out that social networking and Twitter and also traditional television mm -hmm. were a way to mobilize. So facilitate, mobilize, not a cause. I think there are two sides to this uh, story. On the one hand, uh, it has become easier for people to communicate and to get organized. Uh, but uh, this is a dynamic game. I think authoritarian governments uh, will also master the use of social media and will try to use it uh, for two purposes, for propaganda purposes, but also to spy on people. So don't expect the situation to remain as we saw it early this year in the Arab world uh, in terms of the use uh, and the contribution of social media. I think there is another side which uh, we may see happening in other parts of the world where the government has the economic and perhaps the technological capability to use uh, these instruments to try to control people more. I think there are two things to look out for. Uh, firstly, what happens in those countries where the despots have gone, what sort of government emerges, mm -hmm. how successful it is, and what external help the rest of the world will give. In those countries still in conflict, I think we need to watch and see whether that conflict actually moves towards a more democratic government, which we'd clearly like to see, or whether it does not. The short-term impact uh, it, it can be very challenging, particularly for the countries, a lot of the countries involved, and I think you have to move from the short-term euphoria to a reality, which is uh, typical of any major change, you know, political or economic change like the one that happened in the Arab world. Uh, the long-term, obviously, is, is positive, you know, it should bring uh, stability to the region, but when we speak about the long-term, it might be 10, 20, 30 years, and obviously, a lot of difference from country to country. The best course is for a country that's engaged in a sort of a post-revolution format to increase its, to improve its governance, to establish and improve its institutions, to be more responsive to the new public that wants uh, certain things that are different than before. And, um, you know, this implies education, political and governmental institutions, better governments, uh, more responsive governments to public attitudes. And these things are, are, are very difficult to do, and they require a great deal of attention to, to people and to attitudes and so on. We believe that economic growth is, is important uh, uh, because you can only generate a lot of uh, jobs 
by maintaining a relatively high economic growth. And uh, by uh, having a high economic growth, the government could uh, have sufficient revenues which could provide it to support uh, the education, um, medical service, uh, social security system, which are all fundamental for the day-to-day -day life of the people. In some places, I think it's very much a country-by-country -country situation to be hopeful or to be concerned. Um, depends upon what country you're talking about, what its history's been, where it stands in this, in this process. So, you know, there's obviously some countries that are going to be more important markets than others, more important opportunities for doing things. Uh, countries that uh, recover further and faster from uh, corruption, who create new institutions more quickly, who establish representative government, or democracy if you wish, but I prefer representative government. Um, in a credible way, fairly quickly, that's where the opportunities are going to be. Yeah, I speak uh, from the perspective of an institutional investor who is uh, representing a significant part of institutional money. Uh, insurance companies, life insurance companies, pension funds make more than 50% of the total financial assets of the Western world. But they are highly regulated and they usually invest uh, uh, with an asset liability policy which has take, uh, takes into consideration where their liabilities are. And therefore, there is a lot of investment need in those areas, but they is in the wrong place in a way from that point of view because the business which these uh, institutions have in the area are very minimal. So the question is, do they invest other funds of their policyholders in these areas? And there I see some significant obstacles. And these obstacles are, of course, the judgment of the political risk in the area. I think you have direct investors will be very, very quick. And this is sort of partnerships developed with local players, you know, taking advantage of the new opportunities that might be created under uh, the sort of the new, the new policies. Um, for portfolio investors, you know, a lot of them already already there. Mm -hmm. So the question, you know, is uh, is that going to be enlarged to a larger group of investors? And I think that will take some time. You know, I think what we call the frontier investors will still be there. They're there now, but uh, the uh, the more non-dedicated investors, people that have never been investing in the region, I think they're not going to be in the region um, for at least two three years. Mm -hmm.